keep emotions out of the process as much as possible. In 2002, thanks to my friend and super successful poker player Eric Seidel turning down a speaking engagement, a hedge fund manager asked me to speak to a group of traders and share some poker tips that might apply to securities trading. Since then, I have spoken to professional groups across many industries, looking inward at the approach I learned in poker, continually refining it, and helping others apply it to decisions in financial markets, strategic planning, human resources, law, and entrepreneurship. The good news is that we can find practical workarounds and strategies to keep us out of the traps that lie between the decisions we'd like to be making and the execution of those decisions. The promise of this book is that thinking in bets will improve decision-making throughout our lives. We can get better at separating outcome quality from decision quality, discover the power of saying, I'm not sure, learn strategies to map out the future, become less reactive decision makers, build and sustain pods of fellow truth seekers to improve our decision process, and recruit our past and future selves to make fewer emotional decisions. I didn't become an always rational, emotion-free decision maker from thinking in bets. I still made and make plenty of mistakes. Mistakes, emotions, losing, those things are all inevitable because we're human. The approach of thinking in bets moved me toward objectivity, accuracy, and open-mindedness. That movement compounds over time to create significant changes in our lives. So this is not a book about poker strategy or gambling. It is, however, about things poker taught me about learning and decision-making. The practical solutions I learned in those smoky poker rooms turned out to be pretty good strategies for anyone trying to be a better decision-maker. Thinking in bets starts with recognizing that there are exactly two things that determine how our lives turn out, the quality of our decisions and luck. Learning to recognize the difference between the two is what thinking in bets is all about. Chapter 1. Life is poker, not chess. Pete Carroll and the Monday Morning Quarterbacks. One of the most controversial decisions in Super Bowl history took place in the closing seconds of Super Bowl 49 in 2015. The Seattle Seahawks, with 26 seconds remaining and trailing by four points, had the ball on second down at the New England Patriots' one-yard line. Everyone expected Seahawks coach Pete Carroll to call for a handoff to running back Marshawn Lynch. Why wouldn't you expect that call? It was a short-yarded situation, and Lynch was one of the best running backs in the NFL. Instead, Carroll called for quarterback Russell Wilson to pass. New England intercepted the ball, winning the Super Bowl moments later. The headlines the next day were brutal. From USA Today, what on earth was Seattle thinking with worst play call in NFL history? From the Washington Post, Worst play call in Super Bowl history will forever alter perception of Seahawks, Patriots. From FoxSports.com, dumbest call in Super Bowl history could be beginning of the end for Seattle Seahawks. From the Seattle Times, Seahawks lost because of the worst call in Super Bowl history. From the New Yorker, a coach's terrible Super Bowl mistake. Although the matter was considered by nearly every pundit as beyond debate, a few outlying voices argued that the play choice was sound, if not brilliant. Benjamin Morris's analysis on 538.com and Brian Burke's on Slate.com convincingly argued that the decision to throw the ball was totally defensible, invoking clock management and end-of-game considerations. They also pointed out that an interception was an extremely unlikely outcome. Out of 66 passes attempted from an opponent's one-yard line during the season, zero had been intercepted. In the previous 15 seasons, the interception rate in that situation was about 2%. Those dissenting voices didn't make a dent in the avalanche of criticism directed at Pete Carroll. Whether or not you buy into the contrarian analysis, most people didn't want to give Carroll the credit for having thought it through or having any reason at all for his call. That raises the question, why did so many people so strongly believe that Pete Carroll got it so wrong? We can sum it up in four words. The play didn't work. 
Take a moment to imagine that Wilson completed the password.